Well, this morning I'm excited uh, to present this message to you. I've titled it Christmas Means Compatibility. And, um, you know, uh, every season, every Christmas season, we're looking at not just the divinity of Jesus Christ, but at his humanity. And so it's really a big deal, of course. I mean, the deity of Christ is like front and center. I mean, in the Christian faith, you don't play around with, you don't flirt with the deity of Jesus Christ. But at the same time, uh, the humanity of Jesus Christ is just as big a deal. Uh, fully God and fully man. And so today we're going to look at the humanity of Jesus but not just from some you know, doctrinal standpoint where you go away simply believing fully God, fully man. Most of us in this room, maybe all of us, we already believe Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man. So what does it mean for you personally? I mean, how does Christmas mean compatibility for you? What does the fact that Jesus Christ was willing to come in human flesh, what does that mean for your life on Monday morning. So, first of all, I, I want to start off by asking you to consider the frailty of his birth. I mean, it, it's pretty, pretty crazy. It's pretty incredible that, that the God of the universe would decide to come to us uh, as, this, uh, you know, as this infant. I mean, this infant that has to be carried around by other people. This infant that is held in his mother's arms or his father's arms, relatives, uh, shepherds, wise men come and grab a hold of this, this kid and want to hold him. And uh, at any moment, he could be dropped. I mean, thump, right? The Son of God goes crashing down to the floor. And I'm not kidding. I mean, did the nails hurt? Did the nails hurt? Well, you better believe being dropped three feet would also hurt. The God of the universe has come to us in the form of an infant, fully God and fully infant, fully human, fully baby. There's something in that. There's some humility in that. I mean, some incredible humility that God would stoop so low as to become one of us. And so you consider the frailty of his birth. And then you look at the wasted years. I mean... I use that term loosely, but come on, three decades without hardly any documentation? I mean, there's a, there's a few instances where we hear about uh, Jesus in the temple, and he's impressed some folks, and uh, we hear about him at a wedding, and he turns water into wine. But other than a few choice incidents, I mean, we've got some wasted years here, don't we? I mean, three decades without much to show for it. And so I use this term loosely, the idea of wasted years, but the whole point is this. Nothing is wasted from God's vantage point. And what, he's, what is he trying to tell you? What is he trying to say to us that he would go three decades and then launch into full-time work? <laughs> What's he trying to say to you that he would go three decades, 30 full years as a, a, a baby and, and then an adolescent, a teenager, a young adult, and finally into adulthood. And that he was willing to experience all of that and every aspect of that. You know what it says to me? It says that Jesus didn't come to give us church. Jesus didn't come to give us ministry. He came to give us life. And when you begin to see and ask yourself, based on seeing the life of Jesus Christ, did he experience life to the fullest at age 17? Did he experience human life to the fullest at age 24? And yet, uh, where were all the miracles and all the ministry and the discipleship of others and the leading of, of uh, 12 people around? and all? Of, it wasn't there yet. And yet you would have to say that he experienced human life to the fullest. And so it just brings a backdrop to what Jesus Christ is saying to us. When he says, I came that they might have life and have it to the fullest, we can see better what he meant. We can see 
that he didn't just mean have uh, you know life to the fullest for an hour on Sunday or life to the fullest if, if you're a missionary or life to the fullest if you're talking about him all the time. I mean, it's life to the fullest if you're a human that's in Christ. And so uh, what we're seeing then for 30 years is that God's divinity is fully compatible with your humanity. And when I say your humanity, I'm talking about stuff like um, building houses with dad, right? And then, he, and then he hits his thumb with the hammer. Ow, man, that really hurt. And yes, it really hurt. There was no miracle there of abracadabra and it all goes away. And so there was no host of angels that came down to tear him off the cross and make him feel better in the moment. And there was no uh, situation in which he was using his powers to experience less of humanity. We might subtly uh, talk ourselves into these things, but that's what Satan was offering. Remember? Remember the sales pitch of Satan? was that if you are truly the Son of God, then show your power. If you are truly the Son of God, then quit emptying yourself of your divinity here and taking on this humanity in this sense. Show who you are. Save yourself. Uh, don't risk being hurt any further. I mean, this was the sales pitch of Satan. And yet the whole point is that Jesus remained throughout 33 years fully God and fully man. So I want you to consider the normalcy of his life. Now, I'm not saying that he didn't do miracles. Of course he did. But I'm, I'm talking about those wasted years. I'm talking about all those moments when he had to go work in order to eat. You know, he, he didn't have people just rushing to his feet, feeding him all the time at age 14 and 20. You know, he had to work. He probably had to work and earn a living so he could feed himself. And, and who knows if everybody wanted to hire him or not? I mean, have you thought about the true humanity of Jesus and then what it means for you with his divinity in Jesus Christ now living in your humanity? And then lastly, the sufficiency of his death. Never forget that the humanity of Jesus plays into the sufficiency of his death. Blood sacrifice, real human blood, not to, uh, some sort of divine spiritual blood, real human blood with real human pain and blood everywhere. And uh, that's the sufficiency of his death, that the blood of bulls and goats doesn't cut it. But this perfect sacrifice does. So let's start with uh, the eyewitnesses. I mean... Let's, let's take it from uh, the eyewitnesses about Jesus' humanity and let's show that and then let's talk about what it means for you and me personally. So we're going to go to 1 John chapter 1 and what we see here is we see a guy who is passionate about communicating with people that are way off base. I mean, these guys back in the day, 2,000 years ago, you rewind to Jerusalem and surrounding areas. And there's this group of philosophers, and they're saying that Jesus did not come in the flesh and that Christmas is a bust. In other words, uh, there is no God that was fully human and, and fully divine. He, he was fully divine, we'll give you that. But help us help you. In other words, we can give you some secret knowledge, some gnosis, because we're the Gnostics. And we can help you know the true Jesus that was fully spiritual, but not at all physical. In fact, just like these lights are coming down right now, you could just put your hand right through the ray of light. You could put your hand right through Jesus. Because God, I mean, come on, God, God is never going to show up with this on. God's never going to show up wearing what you have on. So he was fully God, but not fully man. And so... The Apostle John writes this letter, and he's opening this letter fighting against that belief. It's really a big deal. He says, what was from the beginning, speaking of Jesus, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands. Even at the, the Last Supper, we leaned up against him. 
Yeah, and we found a, a resting place there as we leaned up against him. He was real. He was physical. We hugged the guy. And so we're telling you people, if you're going to go with this super spiritual Jesus thing without any human side, then you've missed it. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. So you're capturing it. I mean, they're in bold, they're underlined, physical words, right? Physical words from the outset. This is the part of the letter that we tend to gloss over. You know, like, we're like, hurry up, get me to the good stuff. You know, oh yeah, I, Paul, say to you, Romans, you know, we sort of skip over the greetings and the first few verses and we think, let's get into the meat. But I'm just telling you that this letter starts differently. And some of the meat is up front. And so what he's stressing here is that we saw Jesus, we heard Jesus, we proclaimed to you Jesus... And by the way, the reason that we're doing this, now this is a side note, okay? So I'm going to go over to the side, like I'm accustomed to doing. You know my routine. Here I go. I'm going to go over to the side for a side note, and I want you to see that what he's saying here is, I'm writing you so that you can have fellowship with us. We've got fellowship with God, with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit, with each other. But you guys don't have fellowship. Some of you don't have fellowship with us yet. Why not? Because you're denying the humanity of Christ. And so we're writing you these things, and if the shoe fits, wear it. Now, why is this a side note? Well, it's a side note because of that infamous verse that we often preach on and talk about, 1 John 1, 9. It's in the same chapter. And it's talking about confession. You've got to confess your sins, confess your sinfulness. Well, why would you want to confess your sinfulness? Because the same Gnostics, the same guys who were telling you you could have gnosis, they denied the physicality of Jesus. They also denied the reality of sin. And so they had two false claims. And so John is writing them to say, hey, I want you guys to get off that heresy train. You're on the heresy train and there's two cars to it. The physicality of Jesus being denied. The reality of sin being denied. Get off the heresy train and have fellowship with us. Now back to the story. So what kind of confession? Well, the early Gnostics denied the physicality of Jesus. They denied the reality of sin. So notice... John invites them to confess the physicality of Jesus. Look that up sometime, 1 John 4, 2. And then he also invites them to confess the reality of sin. So this is not a Catholic or a Protestant bar of soap confession. This is a life statement. I choose as a life statement to say that Jesus was not physical. I choose as a life statement to say that I have not sinned and I have never sinned. These are life statements from a heretic. And so John is telling them, get off that train and confess the physicality of Jesus and confess the reality of sin. This is not a day-to-day-to-day, -day -day, confess, please clean me. This is a life statement that needs to be changed. And so... We see then from 1 John, same letter, that this is not something to be flirted with, the humanity of Jesus. Look at this, pretty powerful. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And it gets worse. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. Now, I know what you've heard about the Antichrist. Because ever since I was this tall, I've heard about the Antichrist. And I tend to, and maybe you tend to think of the Antichrist as one guy. And there will be a guy. There will definitely be a guy. But the first thing that comes to our minds is that one guy down the road in human history. This is not that guy. This is a general spirit of anti-Jesus. This is a general doctrine, belief system, or spirit that says Jesus was not physical. 
And so the humanity of Jesus is critical. It's not an optional theology. It's not part of a multiple choice faith. This is the spirit of the Antichrist of which you've heard that is coming, and now it's already in the world, this belief system. All right. So it's essential, the humanity of Jesus. But obviously, the big question is, why? Why is it such a big deal for you and me? We go to Hebrews 4 for this, and um, Hebrews, one of my favorite books of the Bible, maybe it's number one for me, but you know, this chapter is talking about Jesus as priest. It says, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens toward where? Through the heavens toward earth. Jesus, the Son of God, he was crucified, buried, raised, and then passed through the heavens again to sit at God's right hand. And it says, let us hold fast our confession. What does that mean? Oh, God, God, I confess, I confess. And this is not some whimpering, guilty, dirty confession. This is, I agree with God that Jesus is my high priest. I affirm that Jesus is my high priest. I confess that Jesus has the market cornered on representing humanity. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. So now you're getting into, oh, okay, the three decades. Okay, the three decades, the wasted years. All right, so, so Jesus, we learn, uh, grew. It says he grew in wisdom and in stature. That means he got taller, okay? He got taller. Probably the diet of that day could have stunted his growth a bit. Maybe we have better diet today, but he was growing, okay? He was growing. His stature was increasing, but also his understanding, his wisdom was increasing. So now, think about that for a second. What does that mean for you? Are you growing? And I don't just mean this way or... Well, okay, this way. I, I mean, are you growing? So the Son of God grew in wisdom. You're telling me that the Son of God learned stuff and it didn't affect his righteousness and it didn't affect his holiness and it didn't affect his identity. So I, apparently, growth and understanding and progression in my understanding of truth doesn't affect my current state. You see, that's what Jesus is modeling for us. That the Son of God can be fully God and yet grow in, in wisdom and understanding. You know, he emptied himself. He didn't know the future. He's in the garden. He's begging, like, if there's any other way, I'm, I'm open. God, there, Father, if there's any other way, I'm open. Obviously, he didn't know if there was another way. He didn't know the future, all of the future, because he told people. Jesus told people... I don't know when this day is. Speaking of a future day, his return, the end times, he says only the Father knows. So he emptied himself of full understanding when he took on humanity and he became a baby that didn't know much. I mean, it's not like he could have pressed a button, pressed the belly button, and then spoken perfect American English if he wanted at age one. He's growing. He, he's got limitations. He, he, he's put on humanity for real. And so it says that he can sympathize with our weaknesses. One who has been tempted in all things. Come on, tempted Jesus. Jesus tempted. I mean, he never failed, right? So how could he be tempted? Tempted means enticed. Tempted means uh, pulled into, right? Right? So, I mean, if there was no pull, if there was no pull to evacuate, right, to get out of here, then why is he sweating blood and crying in the garden? I mean, why is there stress at all? Why not just be calm, cool, and collected in a godly way? And so what you see is he weeps, he experiences physical stress on his earth suit, and um, this is all very real. And yet he's able to pull it off. I mean, he's able to get through this. And so what does this do for you and me? 
uh, well, I mean, the God who came down to be one of us and could, could actually say no to, to temptation now lives in us. So I don't sit around going, gosh, I think I'm, I think I'm 67% dead to sin right now. If I could just grow a little more, I'd be fully dead to this sin. But right now, there's no way I can say no. It's got a hold on me. It's got a grip on me. There's no chance right now. I, I need some growing first. Okay? See, that's not truth. The truth that sets you free is the Son of God who, who is sympathetic to your weakness and who's been tempted fully, and yet without sin, he now lives in you, and he's made you dead to sin and alive to him. And so, what does this sympathetic mean? It doesn't mean, oh, woe is you, poor, poor you. It means he can relate. Therefore, okay, here's the therefore. Therefore, let's, you know, get close to God. Why can you get close to God? Because he's not pointing his bony finger at you, judging you, counting up your sins and going, I can't believe you don't pull this thing off. We just saw the reason we can draw close is because he's not pointing at us. He's pointing at the cross where he was serving as our high priest. And because he's, you know, it's like he's saying, I'm, I'm soft and sympathetic towards you. So that's why we can be close. Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we can receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. What is mercy? Mercy is good, but it's not that good. I mean, mercy's not that great. I mean, mercy is <gasps> lack of punishment. I'm going to withdraw punishment from you. Okay, so I'm going to choose to be merciful. To, I'm going 150 miles an hour uh, down the highway, uh, Route 66 in Virginia. Not on my recent trip, as a teenager, okay? 150 miles an hour, true story, right? I mean, not the rest of the, but the part where I would go that fast is absolutely true and sickening and scary and all that. But let's say I'm going 150 miles an hour, and a policeman pulls me over, and he comes up to my window, and he says, uh, Mr. Farley, I saw you were going, I radared you at 152 miles an hour there. And I, I argue, I'm like, no, officer, I promise you it's only 150, right? That, that does not work, by the way. But he comes up to the window, and uh, he, he's like, yeah, you're going this fast, but I've decided I'm not going to give you a ticket. Okay? Now, that's mercy. I'm not going to give you a ticket. It's the lack of punishment. But grace is more than mercy. Grace is, oh, and by the way, Mr. Farley, I'm not only going to withdraw the idea of giving you a ticket. I'm also going to give you a certificate redeemable for merchandise in the Department of Motor Vehicles gift shop. <laughs> Here's $500. And he slips that to me through the car window. Now that is ridiculous. He should be giving those out to the good drivers, right? Or not at all. But to give that to me is absurd. It's like the prodigal son. He's got his big apology rehearsed. The father says, takes one look at him and says, yeah, go get the best robes we got. We're throwing a party. What? Throwing a party? The guy went off the reservation. And you're doing more than mercy. You're going with grace on this thing? So what the Bible is saying is, you don't just approach God and say, do you think I could dwell at a zero? See, you took me from negative 10 to zero. Could I just be a zero with you? He's like, no, I didn't take you from negative 10 to zero. I took you from negative 10 to zero all the way up to positive 10, even registering you as an 11. Now get close and enjoy me. So if we, if we deal with God on the basis of mercy, we've got half of the message. We've been given the certificate, redeemable, for merchandise, and that merchandise is total righteousness, total holiness, total cleanness, and total closeness. 
For every high priest, now this is talking about the old priest, you know, Aaron, Levi, Old Testament priest. Every priest taken from among men, appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices, he can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided. Anybody here ever feel like you're ignorant? And I don't mean to be insulting you, but you're, you're ignorant. <laughs> and you're misguided, and so am I. I mean, some days you're just like, how ignorant of the gospel and of God's reality and of what is good for me? How ignorant can I possibly be? Now, what this is saying is that you could go back in time to the Old Testament under the authority of Levi and Aaron and still get a priest that dealt with you gently. Now, the the, the obvious implication is how much more is Jesus dealing with you gently? So he can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided. He's beset with weakness, because, and because of it, he's obligated. I mean, these old priests, I mean, get this now. They had to offer sacrifices for you people, and then they had to offer sacrifices for themselves, right? So they really knew what it was like to be beset with guilt and all that. And no one takes the honor to himself, but receives it when he's called by God, even as Aaron was. And then, of course, Jesus didn't say, I'm your priest, I'm declaring myself. No, it was God who declared Jesus priest. And not just priest, but son. You are my son today, I've begotten you. Now, as we finish out the last few verses here, uh, we're going to talk about Mel's place, Melchizedek. I want to present to you, and some of you already know this, but this is Mel's place in this story. Uh, Jesus is a priest, but not from Levi and not from Aaron, but there's this mystery man, right? Many of you know the story of this mystery man. The story is about this long. It's about two sentences. Here's the story of Melchizedek. The story is, we know nothing. No father, no mother, no genealogy, some guy on a lonely road. And Abraham sees him, respects him, pays homage to him, and that's all we know. End of story. Now, Jesus is a priest in his order, not in the order of Levi and Aaron. So, uh, as I've said in the past, it's in the passage, so I want to just touch on this. I mean, it... This is one of the strongest arguments for the message that we proclaim within these walls. This is one of the strongest arguments because the whole point is that you can't call upon Jesus who says he's in the line of a mystery man and then run over here and chat and flirt with Levi and Aaron and say that you'd like a little bit of law with your grace. They don't mix. Jesus is a priest in the line of this mystery man. The law says you've got to go with Aaron. You've got to go with Levi. You've got to have someone in their bloodline, in their lineage, in their heritage. And Jesus is over here saying, Yoo-hoo, over here, over here, totally different line, totally different lineage and heritage. I'm calling myself a priest in the order of mystery man, Mel. And if you want me, you're going to have to ditch the way of the law, ditch the way of Aaron, ditch the way of Levi, and go with a whole new priesthood. And when there's a change of priesthood, there is a change of law. And so you had a gentle priest. I'm not going to lie to you. He was fairly gentle. But how much more can I sympathize? I've got perfect sympathy for you. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both uh, prayers and supplications with small whimpers. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with perfect peace in every circumstance. No stress. God felt so near all the time. Is that what it says? Loud crying, like, you know, when your body's just gyrating and flailing. Your chest is just heaving because you're just letting it all out. Your face is buried in your hands and you don't know what to say and you don't want to know what to do. All you know is it hurts. Okay, this is Jesus. And it's okay for you 
to feel that and go through that. And Christianity is not a band-aid to make that go away. That is called emotions. And it's called suffering and humanity and planet Earth. And I've been there many times. And there's no victorious Christian life where you go up to the vending machine and hit victorious and out comes a life free of emotion, free of struggle, just peace that passes understanding all the time. It doesn't exist. Didn't exist for him. Doesn't exist for you. Why is that a comfort? I hope it's a comfort. Get rid of the standard. Get rid of the victorious Christian life standard and realize you need a priest who is sympathetic because life can hurt. Loud crying and tears to the one who's able to save him from death and he was heard because of his heart, because of his piety, because of his identity, because of who he was. And he was a son. He learned obedience from the things which he suffered. We already talked about that, but there it is in black and white or blue and white. I mean, he learned obedience. Is that okay to say Jesus learned obedience? Yeah, and we're learning it too as children of God. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him. Let me say that again. He became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Have you been obeying Jesus? How much is enough? Because I've disobeyed Jesus. I've been counting. And I've disobeyed Jesus over three million times. So I'm not sure that he's my source of eternal salvation. I mean, from, from the, the, this verse, if I take it out and just put it on a pedestal all by itself, sounds like I better get to obeying. Well, what kind of obedience? Here's a crazy idea. What if we back up a little bit and look at the context? And we'll finish with this. Don't worry, don't worry. I, I'm loving this, but I'm almost done. So just, just relax. It's all good. <laughs> Hebrews 4 says, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that we don't act like Israel and fall into the same disobedience. So what's the disobedience here? Not resting. Not resting in the gospel is the disobedience mentioned in the same chapter. Now back up to the previous chapter. Take care lest there be in any of you, I don't know who, but any of you, this could happen with any of you, because I don't know my audience, I don't have everybody memorized, but take care, so that I don't want in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. What kind of evil is this? Unbelief. So, do you see what's happening then? When it says, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, there were Jews who would not obey the gospel. They rejected it. Unbelief would not rest, did not identify Jesus as Messiah, would not rest in the gospel. And then there were those who looked at the gospel and said, I will submit to this gospel. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Savior. Jesus Christ is my life. I will submit to this. I have no hope outside of him. I believe. And so when we do this, Jesus becomes the source of what kind of salvation? Not in and out and in and out and in and out if you've been good lately, but eternal salvation. So we finish with verse 10, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of that mystery man, Melchizedek. So what do we see today? The humanity of Jesus. I mean, there were eyewitnesses. We held him, we leaned up against him, we hugged him, we saw him, we heard him, he was physical. And this is an essential belief, it's not something to flirt with. And then why is it a big deal? Well, it's a big deal because his divinity, apparently, is totally compatible with your humanity. And apparently you can go three decades without a bunch of outward formal ministry, you could just be enjoying life to the fullest in Jesus Christ because he is life, not ministry. He's ministry, okay? That's an outcrop. That's an outflow. It's a, it's a side benefit. 
It's a side effect of being in Christ. It's like you take a pill and there's side effects. Yeah, well, if you're enjoying Jesus, of course that's going to sort of pour out to other people. But Jesus is life, not just ministry. And so consider the frailty of his birth. Consider the normalcy of his life. Three decades, what are you going to do with that? Jesus, the teenager? Consider the sufficiency of his death. Blood everywhere, real human blood, total forgiveness, total closeness, total cleanness. Christmas means compatibility. His divinity, a perfect fit with your humanity. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you uh, for this time of year. It's the world's greatest excuse. The world's greatest excuse to just say, wow, that you would submit yourself to these limitations. You would submit uh, your wisdom, wisdom we can't imagine. You would empty yourself of that and grow in wisdom. Um, the size, the magnitude of your glory, you would empty yourself of that and you would grow in stature. And you did all this to say to us, I get it. I get it. I really understand. I know what you're going through. I've cried that much and more. Father, thank you for this, this message of your sensitivity to us. Thank you for Jesus who's invited us to get over our sins, to not be obsessed with sins, but to be fixated on the Son himself. Fully God fully man, the perfect Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you guys stand with us? to be here the next couple of Sundays for this season. It's a special time where we're all going to be together and we're going to look at the humanity of Jesus, the compatibility of his divinity with our humanity. You might be thinking stuff like, man, I, I don't know. I mean, I've got like two kids or seven kids or 12 kids. I mean, and my life is like wiping noses and my life is like moving people across town. I'm basically a people mover. 
um, or my life, man, I'm a, it seems like I'm working 12 hours a day. It's just all about my job right now. I hope you've captured what we're talking about here. God's not trying to get you to work less, although that might be a good idea. God's not trying to get you to not do your daily stuff. The, the message of Christmas is that I will come right down into the midst of your day and I will be life to you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus was fully God and yet also fully one of you? Because your answer to that question has implications for your belief today about just how involved is Jesus willing to be. Have a great day. Thank you.